Now, I want you to notice something about my letters here. Are they uppercase or capital? Or are they lowercase letters? How can you tell? Hmm. Well, I know that that is a capital R because a lowercase r is written like this. You make a line down, up, and a curve. That's a lowercase r, and it's small. It's a small letter. This is an uppercase r. It's larger, and you, if you follow my finger, you make a one, you go up and around in and out. That's how you form the letter r, the uppercase r. So these are all capital uppercase letters. How about some numbers? Numbers are so important. We use numbers every day, every day. For example, how old are you? The number of years you are, that's a number, right? The date has a number in it. So let's go over numbers. We have number one, say it with me, one, two, three, four, five. That's one through five. After five comes six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Good job! One through ten. There's a number on here that I didn't put up, and that's the number that comes before one. There is a number. It's zero. Zero is important too. Zero represents nothing. So look at my hands. Do I have anything inside my hands? No, nothing. I have zero. Zero, right? And what would come after 10? Eight, nine, 10. You say it? 11, which is a one and a one. 11. Good job. Let's start from three and count on. Three, four, five. Good job, my friends. Let's move over to shapes and colors. Let's start here. What shape is this? If you, if you said oval, give yourself a pat on the back. Great job, this is an oval shape. It is round and it goes on and on and on. What color is inside that oval shape? Did you say orange? Nice. This is the word orange. It starts with O, A, ah, orange. How about this? This shape has one, two, three sides. It's a triangle. Triangle, great. And the color inside that triangle is green. Green, 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 and this is how you spell green. G-R-E-E-N, green. What's this shape? It's a diamond. It's a beautiful, what color? Yellow, a yellow diamond. And how about this shape? Mm-hmm, rectangle, rectangle, a strip out square a stretched out square good and it is what's inside what color is inside that rectangle purple purple nice work two more what shape is that it's a circle it also goes around and around circle what color is inside that circle Blue, 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 blue. What shape is that? It's a square. How many sides? Count. One, two, three, four. And it is what color? R-E-D spells. R-E-D, red. Yeah, good job. Okay, I want you to go do something. We're gonna do a little scavenger hunt. What's a scavenger hunt, you say? It's when you go and use your eyes and find something, okay? And you're gonna use your hands to pick them up. If you can't pick it up, it's okay. Just as long as you find it. Okay, here we go. I want you to go look in your home 
and go find something red. Go find something red. Right now, get up and go find something red. If you can bring it back, great. If not, it's okay. So remember that this is the color red. This is red. Ready? One, two, three, go. Go up, go find something red. Did you see this triangle? I know it looks upside down, but it's okay. You can turn a shape any direction, upside down, flip it over, it's still a triangle. What did you find that was red in your house? Tell me. Oh, did you find maybe a red apple? Or maybe a red crayon? Or a marker? A red sock or a shoe? Good job. Okay, are you ready for another one? You up for this challenge? I want you to go find something that is the shape, the shape, we're not doing color, the shape of a circle. Go, ready, go. Go find something the shape of a circle in your home. to go look in your house for something that starts with the letter R. Go find something that starts with the letter R. Ready, set, go. So R makes a R sound. What did you find? Did you find rope? Did you find maybe a red crayon? Good. Yeah, the letter R. Nice job. Was that fun? That's called a scavenger hunt. When you go and hunt and look for something inside your home. Great job, friends. All right, I'd like to do a little song with you. This is called, this nursery rhyme actually, it's a nursery rhyme, and it's called the Itsy Bitsy Spider. Have you heard of it before? Yeah? Okay, so I want you to stand up. We'll do a little bit of movement with this. And get your fingers ready, so shake your fingers, shake your hands, and we're going to sing this song, The Itsy Bitsy Spider. I want you to put, take your thumb and your finger, right? Your first finger, and put them together. Can you try that? Put them together. And we're going to say, and then we're gonna take our other thumb and our other finger and put those together. Watch, ready? The Itsy Bitsy Yep, see, do you see I'm turning my hands back and forth? So we're gonna make two L's, and then we're going to connect them together, okay? The itsy bitsy spider went up the water spout. Have your hands go up. Down came the rain and washed the spider out. Now where's your sun? Out came the sun and dried up all the rain. And the itsy bitsy spider went up the spout again. We always clap when we're done. Yay! Bravo, bravo! Let's do it again. Okay, we'll go a little bit faster. Fingers together. The itsy bitsy spider went up the water spout. 
Down came the rain and washed the spider out. Out came the sun and dried up all the rain. And the itsy bitsy spider went up the spout again. <gasps> Yay! Good job, good job. Try teaching that to your little baby brother or sister if you have one, or maybe a cousin. Yeah. Great job, friends. All right, our lesson for today. Like I said, we are talking about my home and the things that we have inside of our home. And there's all different types of homes. Your home may look different than my home, right? So let's make a list and maybe look at some pictures of different types of homes. And then we will talk about the different types of rooms in our home. So maybe right now you're looking at the TV and maybe your TV is in the living area, the living space, the living room. Or maybe you're in the kitchen and you can see the TV from your kitchen. That's a room inside your home. A living room is inside your home. Maybe you're in your bedroom and you have a TV in there and you're watching in there. Or maybe even some people might have a TV outside and you're watching TV outside and you have an outside space like your backyard. All right, so sit down, join me while we look at some pictures and write about making a list, write about the different types of homes that people have and the different types of rooms inside your home. Join me. All right, my friends, in front of us here, I have different types of homes or houses. So let's go over a couple of these. We have a traditional one story house. What is this? It's a teepee. It's a house that Native Americans lived in a long time ago. Over here, we have an igloo where it's very, very, very cold. In the Arctic, some people live in igloo homes to keep them warm. They're actually made out of ice. Some people live in trailers. This one you can hook up to a car. So that means that your home, your house, you can take it anywhere you like. Isn't that neat? Here are apartments. Apartments are a different type of home. My home is a two-story home. So it's a little larger than this one, meaning higher and it has several levels. It has a basement, an ups a ground floor, and upstairs. Some windows in the front. So every home looks different. And what's neat about the different types of home, every home looks different, but it's a place where memories are made, a place where our family and friends gather. It doesn't matter what your home looks like, as long as it's filled with the people who love you. Now, let's move on. I have an empty blank layout of a home, a house. And then you can see I have different squares. So I see squares here. And then I have a triangle for the roof and a rectangle over here. So let's think about, I want you to think about, now that we talked about the different types of homes, and I didn't cover all of them, I just drew a few. There are many types of homes. Let's think about what we might find in each one of the rooms inside these homes. 
So right here, I'm going to write bathroom. This might be where the bathroom is located. This is a bedroom. These are the types of rooms that you'll find in different homes. Another bedroom, the kitchen, and then the living room. So here are the different rooms in a house that you may have. Let's start with the living room. What might you find in your living room? Take a look around your living room. What do you see? You might have a couch and a lamp. You might have your TV that you're watching me on. What about the kitchen? What might you find in the kitchen? Go look in your kitchen and see what's in there. Do you have a refrigerator? Do you have a stove and an oven? Good. What about your bedroom or a bedroom? You might have a bed in your bedroom, place to sleep, and maybe a dresser to put your clothes in. A closet, yeah. What about the bathroom? What might you find in a bathroom? A toilet, a bathtub, also a sink and a mirror. Will you have a sink in the kitchen? Yes. What about outside? What about in your backyard? Will you find maybe grass in the front and backyard? A tree might live out there. Good. So just to review, this is a house and these are the different rooms inside a house. A living room, a kitchen, a bathroom, a bedroom, and maybe another bedroom. You might have a basement or an attic. And these are the things that we would find in the living room, a couch, a lamp, in the kitchen, a refrigerator. In the bathroom, a bathtub, a toilet. In the bedroom, a dresser and a bed. What do you see here? These are homes that you would find outside. Not necessarily for us, but for who? Animals, that's right. This is a beehive. Bees live in the beehive. That's their home. A bird nest, that's where birds live. This is my picture of the ocean. That's where fish and ocean animals live. A tree, who lives in the tree? A little birdie or an owl? And who lives here? A spider, it's a spider web. These are different types of homes that you would find outside. A squirrel would live in that tree. An octopus in the ocean. Great job, friends. Great lesson today, friends. We did so many fun things today. We went on a scavenger hunt. We went over numbers, letter sounds, colors and shapes. We even sang the Itsy Bitsy Spider. And then we talked about homes, our, our homes, different types of houses. Houses that you might find outside that animals live in. And we talked about the different rooms that you would find inside of a house and the things, the objects that we'd find inside those rooms. 
Go exploring today. Go explore your house. How many different things can you find? Maybe draw a picture of your home and the different rooms and things that you would find inside of your home. And then you could venture outside and see if you can find different homes outside, like maybe a home where ants live. But be careful, make sure they're not red ants. I had so much fun, as we always do. I hope you all have a wonderful day, my kindergartners. Okay, let's wash up. Okay. Now the wind up. Bye bye, germs. I'm washing you all the way. Wouldn't it be funny if we could see the germs go away? Hey, want to make believe with me? Let's make believe that we get rid of all the germs. and this is Wally. Good morning, friends. And today we're going to talk about the feeling happy. How you doing, Wally? Well, I have a big smile on my face and my body feels light. I'm super happy. Wally, why are you feeling happy? Well, in the beginning of summer, I planted all these seeds in my garden and in pots in my backyard. And all summer long, I've been taking really good care of my plants. So now I have tomatoes in my pots and I get to go outside in my backyard and pick the tomatoes right off the vine and eat them and oh, they are so delicious. And then my zucchini plant got really big and it grew tons of zucchinis. Oh, it makes me so happy to go outside every day and see how big my zucchinis are. And then we even gave some of our zucchinis away to friends and family. And that made me feel really happy too because they were super excited to get them. My pumpkin plant is really, really, really big, but only teeny little pumpkins, they're still growing. So every morning I go out into my garden to water and to make sure everything's doing okay. And that makes me feel so happy. Oh, yeah, wow, Wally. That would make me feel happy too, and a little proud of taking such good care of your garden in your backyard. Yeah, would you guys like to see some pictures of my garden? I would love to see pictures of your garden, Wally. Okay, here they are. Wally, your garden is beautiful. No wonder it makes you so happy. Thank you. And for the adults in the room, 
Right now, our families are going through a lot of transitions and a lot of new ways of doing things. And it's important that we concentrate on all the things that make us really happy. This will help get through these transitions and tough times a little easier. And what else do you want to say, Wally? Feel your feelings. All right, friends. See you next time. Somebody who um, helps and guides you. Someone who stands out and does their job even if people around them are fooling around. One who does the right thing. A leader is where you're showing initiative. What do leaders do? They do their job. When they see something wrong, they do the right thing. Listening to what others say. Good job! Who can be a leader? Anyone. Everybody. Anybody can be a leader. Everyone can be a leader. Even this whole school. Me. Great answers, everyone. How can you be a leader at home, at school, and in your community? Presented by Shalott Hatton and Binker, Colorado lawyers inspiring the next generation of great citizens. Welcome to Colorado Classroom, learn with me at home. I'm Mrs. Radu, and I have some questions that I was hoping you could help me answer today. Here's a few of them. My first one is, what kind of home do you live in? There are a lot of different kinds of homes. Some people might live in a house, maybe an apartment, maybe a townhouse, or there are lots of other kinds too. So think about it for a minute. What kind of home do you live in? Aha. I heard a lot of good ideas. So think about the type of home that you live in and think about how do you think that your home was made? Who made your home? How did it get there? Who decided that your home would look the way that it looks, that it would have the number of rooms that it has, that it would be as tall as it is, all of those kinds of things. Who decided that your home is safe, right? Who decided that it was strong enough? Who decided how many windows it was gonna have? So many questions, right? I wonder if you've ever thought about those things before. There's a lot that we might not have thought about about how our home came to be. So today, I want us to learn a little bit more about how our homes and other kinds of structures and buildings too got to be there and who made them and who designed them, okay? So when we have questions like this, one of the best ways to get really good information and facts that answer our questions is to interview an expert. An expert is somebody who knows a whole bunch about something specific. So for example, I'm a teacher. I'm an expert at being a teacher because that's what I do all day, all the time, okay? But I'm not an expert on making homes, not even a little bit. So I need to talk to somebody else. I think that I need to interview somebody called an engineer. Have you ever heard of an engineer before? There are some different kinds of engineers. You may have heard of an engineer who is kind of like the driver of a train. That's not the kind of engineer that we're talking about. Does a train driver make a home? No, a train driver drives a train, right? 
we're talking about a different kind of engineer today. So in just a little bit, I'm going to bring in a friend of mine who is an engineer and is going to teach us all about what it means to be an engineer and what that has to do with how your home came to be, okay? Let's learn more. All right, everyone, we are here today with engineer Chase Redu, and he is here to help us understand a little bit more about what it's like to be an engineer. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So if you could just explain to us a little bit, first of all, about where do you work and what is your job and what do you do all day? So I work for Wells Concrete. Uh, we design, manufacture, and produce precast concrete here in the Denver metro area and for surrounding states. My job specifically uh, with that company is a project engineer, so do a little bit of designing. I also do a little bit of uh, what I call project management uh, for the engineers to kind of make sure everything's on track. Um, and kind of my day is a little bit different every day, but uh, generally it's just kind of helping people, um, answering questions, moving things along, then trying to get a little bit of my own work done when I have time also. Okay, and I have a question. What is precast? So precast concrete is kind of the same concrete that we all kind of know and love in sidewalks and roads and on buildings. But what we do is we pour it inside of a building and let it get hard and then we'll put it on a semi and ship it to where it's actually going to be for the rest of its life and kind of put it together all like Lincoln Logs. Ooh, awesome. I love Lincoln Logs. That sounds like fun. It's awesome. <laughs> Very cool. Okay, and so how much school did you have to go to in order to be able to do this job? So I graduated high school and went to college for four years to get my Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering. Um, and then it's not really school, but then beyond that I had to take a couple more tests. Um, to be able to get my engineering license to become a professional engineer. Oh, wow. So you're pretty smart, huh? Uh, debatable. <laughs> okay. So what does all of that have to do with building like houses and apartment buildings and schools and all of those different important kinds of buildings? So as engineers, we're just one piece of the puzzle and all that. Um, we work with architects kind of on the front end. They'll design the building, you know, the general shape, the colors, what type of window and materials. And engineers we come in and we're actually responsible for designing it so that it stands up over time and uh, doing all those calculations and figuring all that out and then once we're kind of done with it it goes on to construction crews and workers to actually build it and then uh, people like you and users get to use it every day for the rest of its life so you have a really important job yeah wow yeah. okay that's awesome are there any other different types of engineers or are the only kinds of engineers ones who build things? Uh, no, there's lots of types of engineers. So um, uh, you heard me mention I have my civil engineering degree, but I would class myself, classify myself as a structural engineer since I focus on buildings. Um, but there's other parts or other engineering uh, things within civil engineering like transportation engineering or uh, geotechnical engineering that deals with soil um, and then outside of civil engineering there's mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, chemical engineering and all those have their own little categories also so kind of your options within engineering are endless. Wow that's yeah. really cool. Yeah. So if you weren't a structural engineer what kind of engineer would you be? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, probably have to say a water engineer. Why? Uh, I don't know, rivers and lakes are fun to deal with and kind of unpredictable at times, so it'd be a good challenge. Huh, that sounds cool. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, one more very important question. I think all of you have probably been listening and thinking, this sounds really cool, really interesting, it sounds like a fun challenge, and you might be thinking that it's something you might want to try someday. So if we have some people listening who might want to be engineers someday, what should they do and practice and be learning about right now? Uh, so the easy answer is math and science. So kind of whatever grade you're in, um, always try to take the hardest math and science classes you can because those are kind of the foundational tools um, that we use day in and day out to be able to do our jobs. But beyond that, I'd say, um, you know, still find time for your art classes, your music classes, and, you know, hobbies and interests like that um, because that's going to really help you kind of get pretty far in engineering is being creative and thinking of ways to use math and science that nobody has really done before. And then um, just always be tinkering with stuff, whether you're kind of mechanical savvy or electrical, um, 
yeah, just make sure you enjoy it, have fun with it. Cool. I didn't know that being creative was so important to being an engineer. Definitely is. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and teaching us all about being an engineer. Thanks for having me. Wow, that interview with Engineer Chase was so interesting. It really made me want to learn more about engineers and the different kinds of work that they do. So I have this passage for us to read together so that we can learn a little bit more about different types of engineering that engineers can do. Engineer Chase told us that he is a structural engineer, but that there are other types of engineering that exist also. So let's read to find out about some other types of engineering. This is called engineers. Engineers have the coolest jobs ever. Do you know why? Engineers aren't just engineers. They are artists, architects, scientists, mathematicians, inventors, and problem solvers. How cool is that? Some engineers design cool buildings like skyscrapers, like the FNF building in Panama. That's this one. They get to be creative to make unique buildings like this one. Look how cool this is. It looks like a spiral that goes up, up, up into the sky. That's amazing. It really makes you wonder how did they make it stand up like that and how did they make it so that it could look like that but still be strong and sturdy. Very interesting. Some engineers design space shuttles and other space vehicles. The Space Shuttle Columbia was the first space shuttle in space. It launched for the first time in 1981 and completed 27 missions. 1981, that's a long time ago. That's almost 40 years ago. Very cool. Some engineers design playground equipment. It is up to them to make sure that it is safe and sturdy and fun too. That is a pretty important job. Some engineers design roller coasters. Without engineers, roller coasters wouldn't be safe to ride. Engineers make sure that roller coasters are strong enough to carry passengers and withstand the force of the motion of the roller coaster cars. Wow, I never thought about that before. I think that roller coasters are really fun and they're really unique and cool looking, but I've never really thought about how um, the people who make them make sure that they're safe and that they're strong enough. So that's really interesting. That makes me kind of want to become an engineer. Very cool. Some engineers design tools to protect the environment. Pollution is a big problem in our world. Some engineers try to help keep our earth clean by protecting the water and the air from becoming more polluted. They design tools that allow us to create clean energy that doesn't create more pollution. So over here is an example. These are um, windmills or wind turbines. You might have seen these before. Um, they're really, 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 really big and they're used to create wind energy. Engineers do so many different kinds of important jobs. They use their creative minds to solve problems in our world and make life more fun. Do you think you could use your creativity to solve problems just like an engineer? Hmm, that's pretty cool. Think about how every day you probably also use creativity to solve problems that you encounter just by living your life. Maybe you have a problem because you're trying to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, but you're all out of peanut butter. How can you solve that problem? Little problems like this come up all the time and we have to be creative to solve them. Maybe those little problems that we solve every day are just the first steps to getting really creative and solving big problems and becoming engineers. Okay friends, after that interview, I'm feeling inspired. I'm ready to get my engineering and my creative juices flowing and to create something really cool. So here's what I want to do. I went around my house and I went looking for some materials and I found some pasta noodles and some 
Play-Doh. And I was thinking that I could use these materials to build some type of structure, just like engineer Chase Redu does. So I'm gonna try that now. And maybe you can think of some tips along the way that would help me to become an even better engineer. And then after we try it together, you could go try it yourself. Let's do it. Okay, friends. So engineer Chase taught us that what engineers do is design things that will make a building be strong and steady. So what I'm noticing about these pasta noodles is that they are pretty, oopsies, flimsy, right? That just broke and I barely even did anything. So I think maybe because they're so long, it makes them not very strong and sturdy. So I'm gonna get rid of that one and I'm gonna try again. Instead, I think I'm going to on purpose break this in half just like that. Now that it's shorter, ooh, when I bend it, it doesn't bend quite as much and it feels a little bit stronger. So I think that that might be a good idea. Okay, I'm gonna start with that. Well, I think that maybe if I cross this like this, that it might make it stronger because it'll have a spot where it's overlapping. But if I just go, if I don't have anything to hold it in place, it's not going to be very sturdy. So I'm going to take a little piece of my Play-Doh here, just a little piece, and put it right in the middle and put this on top. Ta-da! There! Now it's holding in place and it feels pretty strong and sturdy. Okay, that feels like a good start. Okay, now I think I'll break another piece in half and put this around the outsides. Let's give that a try. I better use some more Play-Doh to make sure I can hold it in place. Okay. And I think I'll do another one going this way. Then I think I'll have a strong, sturdy bottom to my structure. I'm thinking about what kind of structure I want to make. Do I want to make a house? Or am I going to make an apartment building? Or maybe a school? Or maybe a grocery store? Could be anything, right? How does it look so far? Pretty strong and sturdy? Notice how I'm wrapping the Play-Doh around on some of them to make it a little bit more strong and sturdy. That seems like a good idea. Okay, so now I've got the base to my structure. Now, what if I want my structure to be taller? What do you think I should do next? Hmm, what if I just go like this? Uh-oh, that didn't work. Hmm, maybe I should make it shorter again. How about this? Well, that didn't work either. Do you think I need to make it shorter or do you think I need a different strategy? Maybe I need a different strategy. Maybe I should use some of my Play-Doh. Maybe if I stick it in here and then stick it here, it'll be more likely to stay. Hey, that's better. Let's try it again. So far, so good. Three out of four. Ta-da! All right, they're all standing, but are they really very strong and sturdy? Not really, they're all kind of falling over. So what do you think I should do next? Well, I could put something on here to connect them this direction, but you know what might be even more strong and sturdy? Is if I went across diagonal to connect them. Hmm. I don't know, maybe not, but let's try it. Let's see what happens. The cool thing about designing and engineering and all of these cool kinds of things that we do is that if something that you're trying doesn't work, you can just try again. Ooh, uh-oh, I notice it's starting to fall. What could I do to make 
to help it stand up. Hmm. Could I put some Play-Doh right in the middle here, like we did on the bottom? that it kind of wants to twist. Do you see that? It kind of wants to twist and fall down. It seems like something isn't quite working right. Let's go back to the drawing board. What could I do differently? That's an important step of the engineering process, is being able to go back and think to yourself, hmm, something didn't work. That's okay. What can I try differently next time? Okay, now I think we can keep our base because our base looks pretty good. But what should we do differently this time? I have an idea. Maybe this time we could try kind of a, a tent style um, and use our noodles to go up to the middle and have them all go up to the middle. That could be cool. It might be a little bit difficult to balance, but I bet we can do it. Let's give it a try. Then I'm going to add another one here. Add it to the top. Hey, look at that. That turned out okay, didn't it? That is a lot more sturdy and stable than the time before. So what I noticed is that when I slowed down and took my time and tried a strategy and didn't give up and then tried a new strategy, I was able to come up with something that's really sturdy and stable. Now, if I was trying to create some type of structure that I could set something on and see how much it could hold, do you think that this would be a good example for that? Maybe not right? Because you can't really put something on top. But if I just want to make something that's not going to fall down, did I do that? Absolutely, I sure did. So now I want you to try it yourself. Go look around your house. What can you use? I happen to find noodles and Play-Doh, but you might have different materials available in your house. Do you have marshmallows? That would be a great tool to use for the sticky part of your structure. Or do you have toothpicks? That would be another great tool. You could also use different types of materials like blocks, right? Or Legos or so many different things. There are tons of options for different tools to build with. That's the great thing about engineering. There's so many different options for you, right? So what I want you to do now is use what you learned from watching me try to build something with my noodles and Play-Doh and think about what materials would work best for you. What materials do you have in your home? And then go give it a try. Maybe try building a structure with a few different kinds of materials and see what you like best. Maybe you could try building one structure that's just really tall and see how tall you can make it, and then try building another one and see if you can make one that can hold a load, hold something heavy, like maybe a book or something like that, and see how much weight it can hold. How strong of a structure can you build? Maybe you could even have a competition with your brother or sister, or your mom and your dad, or your aunt or your uncle, or your neighbor, your friend, or somebody else at home, okay? So there's so many different cool things that you can do when you are practicing to be an engineer. All right, thanks so much for joining me today. I hope you had so much fun and that you'll continue to practice your engineering skills. Bye.
Right now, germs are making people sick. That's scary. So we're all staying home to be safe. Sometimes, things we hear about the virus make us feel scared. When I feel worried, what can I do to calm down and feel better? There are lots of ways to feel better. First, tell your grown-up how you feel. Ask your grown-up for a hug. Hugs are really good at making kids feel calm and safe. Try a keep calm trick, like belly breathing. Lie on the ground and put a toy on your tummy. Take a big breath in and watch the toy go up. Now slowly breathe out and watch the toy go down. So remember, tell a grown-up how you feel. Ask for a hug and practice your keep calm tricks. To learn more, ask your grown-up to go to rmpbs.org. Now you're in the know. so quiet all day long. Well, I've just been thinking about my abuela. Your abuela? Yeah, she lives in the mountains and I'm really worried about her because I saw on the news that there are wildfires near her house and I'm worried something might happen to her. Oh, I totally understand one. Wildfires can be really scary, and it's totally normal to feel worried about family and friends and even other Coloradans who live near the fires. Yeah, I just keep thinking about it over and over again, and my tummy's even starting to hurt. Oh, Juan, I know that feeling. My tummy hurts too when I'm worried about something. What do you think we could do to help you feel better? Well, I could try to take some deep breaths, I guess. Juan, that's a great idea. Taking deep breaths always helps to relax me. Well, my abuela taught me a new way to take deep breaths. You just pretend that you have a cup of hot cocoa in your hands. Hey kids, do you want to try it with us? Get your hot cocoa mug ready. Okay, so first what we'll do is breathe in the steam like this. And then blow on the marshmallows. Breathe in the steam. And blow on the marshmallows. Breathe in the steam and blow on the marshmallows. <sighs> wow, Juan, that was really cool. I really enjoyed that. How do you feel now? Well, I feel a little more relaxed, but I'm still worried about my grandma. I totally hear you, Juan. Um, I wonder what we could do to help you feel better. Well, I was kind of thinking that maybe it would help if I called her and I could check on her and let her know how much I love her. That's a great idea, Juan. We could also ask her what her safety plan is just to make sure she has one and she knows she can come to our house if she needs to. Yeah, I think that helped me stop worrying. Grown-ups, our first instinct when we hear that our children are worried about something is often to tell them not to worry. But when we listen and normalize worry as an everyday part of life, we can help give our children coping strategies to deal with that worry, like taking deep breaths and relaxing before we move on to problem solving. So next time your child is worried, try saying, I hear you, everyone worries sometimes. Let's try to relax and then think about what we can do to feel better. And remember, feel your feelings.
What does it mean to be a good citizen? To be kind, be safe, do your job and show initiative. Help others. It means helping your parents and helping your family and doing what's right for you. When they see something wrong, they do the right thing. Like taking turns and sharing what they have and, and working together. That's right. Well, if you're a good citizen, you're kind to others. It means to help people. Be kind to every person, even if you don't know them. Take care of our community. Great answers. What can you do to be a good citizen at home, in school, and in your community? Presented by Shalott Hatton and Binger, Colorado lawyers inspiring the next generation of great citizens. Welcome back, second graders. I'm so glad you are joining us. This week, we're talking about me and my home. Today, we'll be talking about different kinds of houses. I want you to think for a minute. What type of house do you have? What is your house built out of? What type of materials were used to build your house? Is your house built out of concrete or wood? Think about that for a minute. People in other countries often have to build their house out of different kinds of materials depending on the weather or climate. There's lots of different types of houses around the world. Come on in, let's take a look. Look at some houses from around the world. Do you recognize the style of house that's in your community? What types of materials are they using? House is a building that provides shelter, comfort, and protection. Houses can be along streets, in subdivisions, in developments, and out in the country. Houses come in all different types of styles. Designers and architects plan houses to fit the needs of growing families. Carpenters, plasters, bricklayers, and plumbers, electricians, and other construction workers make these plans come to life. Interior decorators and furniture designers make rooms attractive. Many, many years ago, people would move around, traveling from place to place and living in tents or even caves. They were traveling, searching for food, and when they learned how to grow crops in a certain space and keep livestock, they would settle down and build a permanent home. Some of the first homes were simple one-room structures made from clay or wood, and later people learned how to use other materials such as bricks, cement, or glass. But even today's homes look a lot different depending on where you live. In the United States, a home that you'd see in, compared to a home you'd see in England is very different. So what decides what type of homes are built in a certain area? I want you to think about that. The first consideration might be the weather or the climate. If you live in an Arizona desert, for example, you don't need to worry about cold weather. Instead, you need a home that will keep you cool. In areas where they may have a lot of floods, such as Southeast Asia, homes are built on stilts so that the water will run beneath them instead of run over them. The next thing that you might think about is the type of material available. Trees don't grow or are scarce in the desert regions of Africa. People may live in homes made of mud and grasses. The mud also insulates the home to make it cooler. But people who are living in the mountains may build a home from rocks and timber because there are a lot of that. 
Today's homes are built using many different types of materials, including bricks, clay bricks, wood, metal, and steel. Do you recognize this style of house in your neighborhood? This is a typical ranch style, one story house made out of bricks. Let's take a look at some houses around the world. This house is made out of straw and sticks and mud. Why do you think they, they chose these materials? The weather condition and environment may also affect what people use to build their house. Can you think of any examples? Hmm, let me give you a few. What about if you live in a really, really cold place? Have you ever seen an igloo in Colorado? Why could we not build an igloo in Colorado? What about a country that doesn't have very many trees? How would they build their house? Think about that. have at least 60 minutes of physical activity a day. Let's go ahead and take our brain break now. Okay class, so for today's activity, you are going to draw your home or maybe a home um, that you would like to have, and then we're gonna write some sentences. So while you're drawing your home, I want you to think about what type of materials your home might be. So I'm gonna start with my bottom part of my home. And then I know that every house has to have a door. And then my house is going to have an upstairs with some windows. So it's going to be two stories. And then maybe there's a little window over here on the one story. And um, my house is made out of wood. So it just has siding that goes across. 
and you're welcome to use different colors. Just go ahead and have fun with it and design your, your own house. Okay, so my house is made out of wood, out of wood, so I know that since it's made out of wood, I probably have some trees around my house because wood comes from tree trunks. So there's gonna be some trees in my in my front yard too. Okay, and then I need to have a roof and on my roof, I'm gonna have maybe some shingles going across. Just like that. Those are my shingles. Okay, and then I'm gonna have a chimney on my house with some smoke coming out. Okay, now, so now that we have drawn our house, I'm gonna list the materials you will use on your house and tell why. So I wanna make sure that I'm writing the full sentence. I'm doing a response with a full sentence. So um, when I'm doing that, I can actually just look at my question or statement and pull it right out of there. So it says, list the materials you will use on your house. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna start it with, the materials I will use on my house are, so I'm gonna say the materials I will use on my house are, remember I said it was made out of wood. Okay, so I'm gonna say it's made out of wood. And then maybe I'm gonna say and metal because there's probably metal around the windows, things like that, okay? Now I'm going to say, it says write a sentence describing your house and your favorite part of it. So when you describe something, it means to tell about it. Um, so I'm going to say my house has a tall roof and two stories. So two stories are the same as two floors, not like a story book, but like um, a story is a floor. Um, then I might write one more sentence. I might say, my house is in the woods. I'm gonna say my house is in the woods with all the trees on it. So I'm just gonna say my house is in the woods. And then I'm gonna put a period at the end. And I started my sentence with a capital and um, so there is my house. Wasn't that a fun activity? Now find a piece of paper and walk around your home and write as many types of materials as you see in your home.
Okay, we have Isabella and Lorelai, and they just finished their activity. So can you show me what your houses look like? Oh, wow, look at that. Okay, so what types of materials, Lorelai, did you use on your house? Wood, it is st strong. Metal, rain drops f fall. Okay, and Isabella, can you show me what materials you used on your house? Or tell me about them? Ice, there is nothing else there. Yeah, so you, um, your house is an igloo, and so when you build an igloo, what type of climate is it when you build an igloo? Either in the North Pole or the South Pole. So what does that mean? What is the temperature like? It's very cold. So it's very cold. So why did you use ice? Because there's nothing else. No, there, there might not be any other materials there. That's right. And Lorelai, you used wood and metal, and you said because the wood was strong and the metal, the rain will drip off. So what type of climate or weather do you think your house could be in? Summer. It could be in, in warm weather. Yep, you could use wood in lots of different places. What would you need in order to have a wood house? What is wood? Where does wood come from? It comes from trees. Yeah, so you would need to have lots of trees around where you live, right, to build a wood house? Okay, and then how did you describe your house, Lorelai? Um... How would you describe it? That means, how would you say what it looks like? Um, I, I noticed that it says it looks nice and that you like your room. Okay, what about you, Isabella? What did you say? How would you describe your house? Um, it looks like an Easter egg. I like how it looks. Wow, great job. I like how it looks too. So if you're describing it, what would you say? You said it looked like an Easter egg. Good job. Okay, well, thank you guys. Did you have fun doing your activity? Yeah. Okay, great job. Thanks for joining me today. We learned some really cool information all about houses. 
I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining me for today's Math Minute. Today, we will be counting off the decade. What is a decade? A decade means 10. So, instead of counting by tens, 10, 20, 30, 40, we're going to start with a number like 12 or 15. Let's go. Okay, students, we're going to go ahead and count off the decade using our hundreds chart first. So, go ahead and take your hundreds chart. Now, I noticed that in the right column, these are all going up by 10. This hundreds chart is numbered 1, 2, 100. Now, what happens if we start with a number in the middle? Well, let's look at 3. 3, 13, 23, 33. Hmm. Okay, let's go ahead and see how many numbers are between 3 and 13. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So we know that 3 adding 10 equals 13. I also notice that in these columns, the 1 spot is staying the same, but the 10 spot is going up by 1 each time I add 10. Let's go ahead and take a look at that on a number line. If I start with a number that is off the decade, meaning not number 10, we're going to start with number 4. And I add 10, what will be my next number? Yep, you're right, it's going to be 14. Now again, I know that because we are adding 10. So the 10 spot is going to have a 1. Now, what happens if we add another 10 to our 14? Remember, the 10 spot is the only one that's changing, so it's going to go up by 1, so it's going to be 24. Let's check our answer. Yep, that's right. All right, guys, thanks for joining me for my Math Minute. We'll see you next time. Miles, why are you working out so much? Oh, you want to be a smile power hero. Exercising is good, but don't forget about your teeth. Tus dientes. Then you'll be on your way to be a smile power hero. hero. So let's all help Miles. What can we do to take care of our teeth? That's right. It starts with brushing for two minutes in the morning and night. Por la mañana y por la noche. What else can we do? Yes. Flossing. Last one. What kind of doctor do we see about our teeth? Correcto. It's good to see the dentist two times a year. Miles, check out this cape. You're a smile power hero now. Learn more about becoming a smile power hero and the importance of staying cavity free at deltadentalcofoundation.org slash smile power hero. Now you're in the know. One out of seven Colorado kids doesn't always know where they'll find the next meal. Feeding Colorado's food banks makes sure these kids and their families have enough to eat. Grocery stores and food companies donate food. Farmers and ranchers help too by donating all kinds of food. Fruit, vegetables, meat, milk, cheese, eggs, bread, 
boxed and canned food, too. People called volunteers share their time to help sort and box the food. Families who can't afford to buy food can go to food pantries to get free groceries. We all need food to grow strong and be healthy, so it's okay to get help if you need it. Nice people and caring companies give Feeding Colorado Food Banks money to help deliver the food all over Colorado. Small donations can provide several meals. To find help or learn more, ask your grown-up to go to feedingcolorado.org. Welcome back, third graders. I'm so happy that you're here with me again. I'm super excited for today's lessons because we will have some fun experiments today. If you remember from my last lesson, I told you that every week is going to be centered around a science topic. And this week, we are learning about me at my home. Last time, we talked about our home of our bodies. Today, we are going to be in our physical homes and do some things in our kitchen. So I'm super excited. And don't forget, we're always tying in our reading and our writing skills with that topic of science. I'm really excited. I hope that you have so much fun today. Let's read our learning target together. It says, today I will distinguish my point of view from that of the authors. So if you remember, a learning target is something that we're going to aim for or try to reach by the end of this lesson. So let's talk about that learning target. There is a new word in there, distinguish. Can you say that with me? Distinguish. Yeah, distinguish means to point out or recognize. So we're trying to recognize or figure out our own point of view from that of the authors. That means that we might agree with the author or we might disagree with the author, but we need to stop and think about our own feelings or, or thoughts. Good job, third graders. Now we can talk a little bit more about well, what is point of view? You want me to figure it out, but I don't even know what it is. So let's find out. So point of view. Point of view is going to be how someone feels or thinks about something. So it's like an opinion, how you feel or think about something. When we're talking about the author's point of view, authors usually feel a certain way about a topic. Even if they're giving facts about the topic, they can still have an opinion on it. So pay close attention to the clues in the text so you can figure out what the author's point of view is. Some clues could be if they say, I think, I feel, this is important. These are going to be some clue words to help us figure out how the author feels. And then in our learning target, we also talked about distinguishing or pointing out your own point of view from that of the authors. So this is when you need to put your thinking cap on. This is when you need to think and ask yourself, do you agree or disagree with the author's point of view. For example, my favorite color is green. That's how I feel about colors. But maybe you're thinking, hmm, Miss Hoy, I disagree with you because maybe you have a different favorite color. Or maybe you say, Miss Hoy, I agree with you because my favorite color is green too. So that's you practicing to distinguish your point of view from mine. Let's do one more practice. 
My favorite animal is a jellyfish. Think, do you agree or do you disagree? If you're telling yourself, I agree with Miss Hoy, then you just came up with your own point of view and you had a connection to mine. Or if you said, no, Miss Hoy, I don't think jellyfish are my favorite animal, then you still distinguished your point of view from mine. And it's okay to disagree. So that's what we're going to do today. We are going to find the author's point of view and think about our own point of view. All right, let's get started. Okay, remember that good readers use their background knowledge to help them better understand the text. And we have some background knowledge from our last lesson. And then I'm going to also show you some vocabulary words that will help us better understand the text, just like we did last time. I also want you to know that this text is going to be a connection, like I said, to our last lesson, but it's also going to be a connection to what we're going to do later in the kitchen. All right, so let's get into our vocabulary. Some of these words might be familiar and some might be new. Our first word is nutrients. Read it with me, nutrients. Nutrients is a noun, so it's a thing, and it's a substance that provides nourishment essential for growth and maintaining life. So nourishment is what our bodies need and essential means that it's very important. So nourishment that's essential for us to grow and stay alive. Nutrients. Our next word might be familiar to you. The word is artificial. Read it with me, artificial. Artificial is an adjective, and we're specifically talking about food, so artificial means that it's made by humans rather than occurring naturally, where you can find it in nature. Artificial. Our next word is enriched. Read it with me. Enriched. Enriched is an adjective, which means it's going to describe something, and it means having added nutrients. So we learned what nutrients was, and enriched means that we're adding nutrients. Enriched. Our next word is kind of similar. The word is fortified. Read it with me, fortified. This is another adjective, so it's going to describe something. And again, it's specifically describing food. So it means having had vitamins that were added to increase its nutritive value. So when we're adding vitamins to make it have more nutrients, kind of a connection to our other words, fortified. Good job. All right. Our last word might also be familiar. The word is alternative. Read it with me, alternative. And again, this is going to be a connection to food. This is an adjective, so it's going to describe something. It means available as another choice or option. Alternative, so we have a different choice. Good job, third graders. All right, so now that we have our key vocabulary and our background knowledge from our last lesson, let's get into reading our text. Read along with me. Remember to follow along as I read and to keep thinking about our learning target. We're looking for the author's point of view and thinking about our own point of view. All right, follow along as I read. Nutrients in Our Body by Miss Hoy. Do you like cereal? How about bread? Have you ever heard this saying, you are what you eat? Well, if you like to eat any food really, then you're eating important nutrients for your body to be healthy. However, it's really important to eat the things that your body truly needs. Some foods, such as cereal and bread, are enriched with nutrients that our bodies need. 
If you've ever had white bread, it's white because the process of making it has stripped or taken away some important nutrients for our body. When white bread is being made, thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, and iron are added to it. These nutrients are things that are already found in whole grain bread. Doesn't it seem silly to eat food that has nutrients artificially added to it when you could eat food that naturally has those important nutrients? If it's true that we are what we eat, I think we should eat naturally good foods for our body to be healthy. Let's look at cereal. Cereal is another food that has a lot of added ingredients. Some of those ingredients are healthy nutrients for our bodies and other ingredients are not healthy nutrients such as sugar and artificial colors and flavors. A lot of breakfast cereals are fortified with iron and other important nutrients. However, there are other breakfast options that are naturally fortified. A good alternative to sugary breakfast cereals is oatmeal. Oatmeal is also considered a cereal, but it's a whole grain that is filled with good for you nutrients. You can add fruits and nuts to your oatmeal to make it even tastier and more nutritious. Our bodies work hard and need healthy nutrients to keep it going. Next time you're at the grocery store, Think about what foods you want to eat to keep your body healthy. Now that we've read our text, now we need to go back into the text to actually find the author's point of view. And maybe you were already thinking while I was reading the first time, ooh, I know what the author's point of view is. So let's go find those clues that tell us what the author was feeling about the topic. When I'm looking in the text, I see at the very first paragraph, it says, it's really important. Well, I know that that was a key word. So let's see what, it, what else it says behind those words. It says, it's really important to eat the things that your body truly needs. So right there, I can tell that the author is telling us that we should only eat what we need, maybe not what we want. Let's see if we can find some more clues. Hmm, ooh, in the second paragraph, do you see where it says, doesn't it seem silly to eat foods that have nutrients artificially added to it when you could eat food that naturally has those important nutrients? That definitely sounds like the author's opinion, that she thinks it's silly to eat artificially flavored or artificially added nutrient-based foods. Let's see if there's more examples. Ooh, right here, the very first sentence says, I think, that was a key word that we talked about earlier, I think we should eat naturally good foods for our bodies to be healthy. Are you already getting an idea of what the author's point of view is? Good job, third graders. Maybe you're also thinking about if you agree or disagree with the author. That's also a really good job. Let's keep going. The author says here, a good alternative, that was a vocabulary word, a good alternative to sugary breakfast cereals is oatmeal. So now she's even telling us what she thinks we should eat instead of sugary breakfast cereals, what should we eat? That's right, oatmeal. All right. And then at the very end, she says, next time you're at the grocery store, Think about what foods you want to eat to keep your body healthy. So already I can tell that the author has a pretty distinct or obvious point of view. Can you tell what it is? Did you say that the author thinks that we should eat healthy and natural food? You're correct. That is what the author's point of view is. So let's write that down. If you'd like to follow along, 
Grab a piece of paper and something to write with. All right, let's write the author's point of view. The author thinks that we should eat naturally nutritious food and whole grains. Good job, third graders. So now we need to distinguish our point of view from that of the authors. We're going to use the sentence stem, I agree or disagree with the author because mm. So let's write that down. I agree or disagree with the author because, mm, so now we need to decide, well, how do we feel? Do we agree that we should eat naturally nutritious food and whole grains, or do you disagree? Take a moment to think about how you feel. Great job, third graders. Now I'm going to share my feelings about the topic. I agree with the author, especially because we talked about how important it is to keep our bodies healthy in our last episode that I think we should keep doing that by eating the right foods. So I'm going to write that and you can follow along with me or write your own point of view. I agree with the author because I think that it's important to eat the foods that keep my body healthy. All right, third graders, you did a fantastic job finding out the author's point of view and distinguishing your own point of view from that of the authors. Now, it's what we've all been waiting for. We are gonna move over to the kitchen to do some experiments that tie in with what we learned today, especially what was in our text about enriched and fortified foods. So come on to the kitchen with me. Welcome to my kitchen, third graders. All right, before we get started, I told you we were going to do some science experiments, but if you would like to do a science experiment or kitchen science at your house, please make sure that you have adult supervision and permission. Everything that we're going to do today is totally safe. It's just always a really good practice to make sure you have adult supervision and permission if you're going to be doing any type of science. All right, so let's get started. I'm gonna zoom in on our hands here. All right, so you can see that I have a box of breakfast cereal here and it is iron fortified. So when we look at the label, you can see that it has 18 milligrams of iron, which is 100% of your daily value. So that means how much you need for a whole day's worth of servings, you need 100% and it has 100% in this box. Now, iron, to make a connection to our uh, lesson before about our circulatory system, iron is really important for our body. The body uses iron to make a protein that's called hemoglobin. Can you say hemoglobin? 
Good job, third graders. So hemoglobin is located in the red blood cells and the hemoglobin is actually what carries the oxygen. So we said that those red blood cells were kind of like delivery trucks. Well, hemoglobin is actually what's carrying it in the red blood cells. So that's why iron is so important. Now iron is a metal. So if you know of other things that are metal, like coins or maybe your refrigerator or chairs that you've seen, maybe at school the legs of the chairs are metal. Iron is a metal and magnets are attracted to iron. So when I have this, if it has that much iron in it, then you would think that it's going to be, here I have a magnet, you would think that it would be attracted. Now, do we see? It's not, doesn't seem to be moving, right? This is a really strong magnet. If you'd like to do this at home, this is a neodymium magnet. So I got this just on Amazon, but it's a really strong magnet, but it doesn't seem to be working. However, the box tells me that it really does have iron in it. So you might see that I have some water and then a glass bowl here. So we're going to put our um, total breakfast flakes into this bowl, kind of like we're gonna eat some cereal, but we're going to use water. And I'm going to fill it up pretty high. Water has a lot of surface tension, so you can make it go a little above the rim where it kind of bubbles at the top. Okay, so that's a lot of water. Now I'm gonna put some flakes. I'll do different sizes so you can see how it works. All right, here's my magnet. Now watch what happens with the flakes. Do you see that big one moving? Now it's really big, so look at it. I'm pulling it away. Ooh, this little one. You can see, isn't that so neat? That iron in the breakfast is attracted to it. Now let's see if a little one will do it too. So get out of here, big one. Oh, look at this little one. How cool is that? So now we know that it really does have iron in it. It is iron fortified. Oh my goodness. If you'd like to do this at home, now you know what ingredients you need. Doesn't take much. Woo. Maybe you could race somebody and see if your flake will win. All right. So that was our first experiment. Again, it kind of makes a connection to our learning because hemoglobin is so important in our body and iron is what helps carry that. Now I have a bonus. I have a bonus. Ooh, I don't want to spill this. This is why we need adult supervision. I have a bonus experiment, which you might see over here. So move these out of my way. I have dissolved the shell of an egg. Oh my goodness, what cool science, kitchen science did we just do? It's literally so much fun to touch you guys. Okay, so if you wanna do this, super easy. All you need are obviously some eggs and also let's just look at the size difference. Oh wow. So we're gonna dissolve that shell but then Osmosis, which is another thing that we could learn maybe another time, makes it get really big, full of the vinegar. So what you'll need is some eggs, you'll need a glass with a lid, and then some distilled white vinegar. So I have a whole bunch because I use it for cleaning my coffee pot. All you'll need to do is put your egg gently, you don't want to crack it, so put your egg gently into your glass. Did I crack it? Hold that. Put your egg in there. And then you will pour the vinegar just to cover the egg. And if you wait 24 hours or even better, 48 hours, your egg will look just like mine. Pretty cool. All right, I'm gonna let this one sit. So I have two really fun eggs. 
All right, third graders, those were my two kitchen science experiments for you. Again, if you do get supervision from an adult and permission, I hope that you have fun doing these really cool science experiments. All right, third graders, what a fun day we had today. I'm so proud of all of your hard work and I had so much fun with you. All right, let's review our learning target just to make sure that we actually reached our target or hit the target. Our target said, today I will distinguish my point of view from that of the authors. Did we do that? Yes, we did. And we even got to do a super fun experiment with magnets and iron in our own breakfast cereals. So cool. I also got to show you really quickly another experiment that you could do at home with an egg and some vinegar. All right, third graders, I hope you have a great rest of your day. I had so much fun with you. I'll see you next time. sucks having to not be able to go to school and um, not talk to your friends, you know? Staying at home sucks because I don't get to see any of my friends in person. You're right, this does suck. It's hard. Maybe you're used to seeing your friends every day at school, and now you haven't seen them in a while, and that's a huge loss. My mom wouldn't even let me go to the store with her, and all I needed was just to get out of the house. It's going to be really hard not to do that anymore. It's important to know why we are physical distancing. So physical distancing is helping to reduce the number of people getting sick at once. We're still able to touch base with our friends through FaceTime, Zoom, or other virtual platforms. And know that your friends are in similar situations and are also at home. To learn more, talk with a parent or ask them to go to rmpbs.org. Now you're in the know. This storm isn't so bad. I'm barely afraid at all. I wish I could say the same. This is... Buster, come in. Okay, maybe I am afraid, but I'm not going to mom and dad. Ah! If you're afraid or something is really bothering you, don't just keep it inside. Tell someone, you'll feel better. I guarantee it. Ask a grown-up to visit pbskids.org to find out more.